My name is Michael Diaz. I'm a medical oncologist, hematologist, board certified in internal medicine. I practice in St. Petersburg. I'm uh, one of uh, Dr. Weaver's partners. I work with Florida cancer specialists. Um, and uh, for those of y'all that haven't heard of us, we're the nation's largest uh, privately owned medical oncology practice in the U.S. We have over 200 physicians and somewhere near 90 to 100 site, clinical sites in the state of Florida. Um, I have a unique role with my practice, and um, with my practice, I am the director of patient advocacy. And I've always had this mindset, and I always want to make sure that people have access to the proper care. And because of that, and the interest that I have in the organizations that I participate in, my practice realized, well, we're a large group. We need to have someone speaking for our patients. So they created a position for me, and I became the director of patient advocacy for my practice. So, well, that's nice, Michael. What does that, that mean? What, is it, what do you do? Well, I spend a lot of time working with my professional organizations and our elected officials to make sure that patients have access to care. And just to give you a perfect example, well, first of all, as we all know, our healthcare system is governed by all sorts of rules and legislation. And to be quite honest with you, there's a lot of unintended consequences to legislation that comes out that ends up adversely affecting some group of people. And that's sort of how it can work with our cancer patients because our politicians can come up with a good plan that seems to work great for 80% of society or 80% of people that need medical care, but it could be extremely detrimental to our cancer patients because they have a lot of unique needs and need unique things that the rest of the patients don't. And, and I'll give you a perfect example. I don't know, but last year, the government was trying to implement a mandatory experiment on all Medicare patients called the Medicare Part B Demonstration Project. How many of you all have heard, heard about that last year? Probably not a lot of people. Probably not a lot of people. Uh, in this project, they had a good intent and a good purpose. They were saying, we've got to do something about drug prices. You know, drugs are too expensive. And that's what they were saying. And they thought, well, we can discourage the use of more expensive drugs by simply just not reimbursing enough to cover their cost. And what they were doing, they were going to randomly assign 75% of the Medicare patients in this country by zip code into experimental arms where, the more, where drugs would be reimbursed at a lesser and lesser rate to try to see if they can discourage the use of the more expensive drugs. Now, something like that works when you've got options, when you've got generic options that are just as good. Something like that works in that situation. But that doesn't really work in cancer care because we all have unique conditions and will require specific drugs, a one-of-a-kind drug. And yes, it's new. And yes, it took a lot of money to develop that drug and a lot of research and a lot of resources. And it may not be as as lesser expensive as some of the generic products that have been out there for, for 20 or 30 years or that are 10 years older, but they work a heck of a lot better. And we realized that this was going to significantly adversely impact a lot of our cancer patients. And so the healthcare community got together. And when we saw that this demonstration project was being formulated, we saw the template, we saw what they were proposing. So we galvanized all of the professional, medical professional societies across the country and all the patient advocacy organizations to send a letter saying, do not implement this. This will hurt patients' access to care. You know, and it was really interesting because this ended up being, as things are in DC, more of a political issue than a factual issue. When I say political issue, this was one of the things that the president was wanting to do as, as, as one of the last achievements in his office. He was wanting to try to do something to try to tackle the cost of drugs. So this ended up being a bipartisan issue in all reality. You had the, the Democrats that were standing behind the president as they have throughout the majority of his term. And then on the other hand, you ended up having the Republicans saying, this is the worst thing you could do for patients. Why are you wanting to do this? Ended up being a very big political thing. So common sense didn't prevail. So we had to go grassroots. 
we went to all of our patients in all my clinics and all my 90 plus clinics we had patients getting informed as soon as they came into the waiting room they were each given handouts on what this part b experiment is what it's doing and how it could affect their care we had patients sign petitions if they wanted to we had well over 20,000 patients sign petitions the rest of them that didn't want to sign petitions and still wanted to get involved actually we gave them email ad uh, websites to go to so that they could email their elected representatives and to give you an idea of how powerful that is we had multiple um, chief of staffs from the different members of the House of Representatives here in the state of Florida calling our office manager saying stop telling your patients to email us all of our email boxes are full <laughs> and once again you had some of the elected officials that were going along party lines and one of our senators I'm not going to mention names I'm not trying to point fingers but he was not going to back down he was going to support the president but because they got his office got over 5,000 emails it caused him to change your mind and this is one of the perfect examples I can give you I walked into the senator's office just a couple of months ago and met with his chief health advisor and I introduced myself she said I know who you are I got over 5,000 emails from your patients in my inbox and I thought you know oh my goodness this meeting's not gonna go well and she said I really want to thank you for doing that I thought that the project the demonstration experiment the project was not a good idea and I was able to use all of those patient emails to be able to persuade the senator to not support this effort so things like that went over went on throughout the entire country thanks to the most powerful advocate that we have and that's our patients now it's interesting that you don't hear a lot about these things and that's unfortunate but these things aren't sensational they don't make the news until people really start to get hurt our goal is to try to prevent all that from happening so one of the things and one of the key to being your own best advocate is also to be informed you know I spend a lot of time going to DC in fact I was even invited my or one of my organizations was invited to go to CMS the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to advise them and give them ideas on how to make drugs and pharmaceutics more accessible to patients so we spend a lot of time on that end but no matter how much we press and how much we try to educate it all comes down to trying to educate the people because you all determine who gets into office and so that's one of the things that's very important another example of another big political issue that's going on right now how many of you all are familiar with pharmacy benefit managers do we have any pharmacy benefit managers here tonight before I start speaking okay so I saw some people try to raise their hands pharmacy benefit managers are hired by insurance companies to man to manage oral pharmaceutical benefits okay and it sounds like a good idea but when you sit down and you look at it in the big picture of things these guys are just a middleman and we all know when it comes to businesses what happens to middlemen well middlemen sort of help increase the cost of things and I saw an interesting study that was published just I think February or March of this year and it showed that for the average price of a pharmaceutic for, for every dollar that's spent on a pharmaceutic only 60 cents of that dollar goes back on the average to the pharmaceutical company 40 cents of that dollar 40 percent goes to other people and people are talking about the cost of drugs and we wonder why they're so expensive well there's so many other things going on and one of those reasons are the pharmacy benefit managers and I'll give you an example of what they do one of the many things they do to help increase the cost of drugs they go to the specialty pharmacies that dispense the medications and I'll use my practice my practice with over 200 physicians we have our own specialty pharmacy to dispense the oral pharmaceutics so they came to us and um, they said well you guys owe us certain fees and this is six months after a transaction took place for a patient you owe us a certain percentage of fees they're doing this to specialty pharmacies across the country sometimes it's six percent sometimes it's eleven percent it depends I said, well, why do we owe you these fees I said because of your quality measures and they said well what quality measures are you talking about and they don't have specific measures for oncology drugs 
they use specific measures for antihypertensive medications, for cholesterol medications, for diabetes medications, which are not dispensed and are not managed in our pharmacy. And in fact, the funny thing is that every single one of the patients that they looked at from my practice had a perfect score for compliance, for fill rate, for making sure that the drugs got filled on time. They said, well, we can't use that perfect score because it doesn't work in our equation. Because <laughs> you would think that would mean, oh, wow, you've got great quality. You shouldn't owe a fee. No, what they did was they took the average compliance rate for blood pressure medications, cholesterol medications, and diabetes medicines in southwest Florida and applied that to my pharmacy. Said, you owe us a fee for that. So that's just one of the many examples of how you get, okay, so they give my pharmacy the fee. Well, what does my pharmacy have to do? I mean, they, they, they can only absorb so much before it has to be pushed back onto the customer. Okay, so that just gives you a perfect example of how expensive the system can get. And in fact, this is getting so out of hand, we've been working with our legislatures. We have two bills that have been developed and dropped to try to help regulate some of this nonsense. And we're working with one of our local congressmen to develop another bill. And so you've got to get involved. But it's interesting that people don't even know these problems exist. I'd be quite honest with you, I wouldn't know these problems I wouldn't know that these problems exist if I didn't do what I do. But that's one of the reasons why I think that it's important that everybody try to get educated. And the question everybody has, well, what's the right resources? How can I be aware of these things? Because I want to know about these things. Well, I, I don't have a great answer for you, but one of my organizations has a very good um, patient advocacy uh, component to it. It's Community Oncology Alliance. And so if you go to their website, if you want to write this down, it's www.coaadvocacy.org. And you go to the web page, and you, you can look, and you can read up on things. And if you want to, if you dare, you can enter your email address, and they can send you updates when things are available. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I'd like to do, I'd like to be able to have a patient chapter set up. It would probably have to be in St. Petersburg because that's where I practice, where we could meet and we could talk about these issues and educate patients on these issues. And in fact, you know, it, it can be empowering to learn about these things. And in fact, I'd like to recognize one of my nurses who is actually here tonight. She is a cancer survivor herself. Could you please stand up, Michelle? So Michelle... She, she's an oncology nurse and a cancer survivor, and she went with um, Community Oncology Alliance to D.C. earlier this year to help express and explain what patients are going through. Not only does she know firsthand, but she also works with patients every day. She sees what they're going through to help give some perspectives. They need to hear that directly from the patients in some way, shape, or form. But you, you know, the main thing is that we need to mobilize better our, our, our patients and society. So if there's anything that I could leave with you all tonight is do what you're doing now. And this being, by being here, you're being an advocate for yourself or for your family member or for your loved one. You're learning more. You're understanding more so that you can take better care of the myeloma condition and also learn how to be your own better advocate. So first of all, I, I applaud you all for being here, and I want to thank you all for being here so that we can have the opportunity to share this with you all. So thanks, everybody.